All right, welcome back to the podcast, everyone. Today we have special guest Lucia Ajic. Lucia is the creator of Neka Nova Pricha, one of the most popular podcasts in Croatia. A chatting about personal growth, relationships, and parenting, Lucia also advocates for women in her community to start and grow their own businesses. In this episode, we're going to meet the woman behind it all. Lucia, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me, and thank you for the lovely introduction. <laughs> Yeah, of course. I appreciate you taking the time to come do this. I know you're busy and I know you have a podcast of your own, which we're going to get into. But, you know, if you can first sort of start us off by telling us a little bit about, you know, your early life, where are you from? Where'd you grow up? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was born and raised in Croatia by Croatian parents. I was born in Zagreb and I've spent the majority of my life here. I did travel um, throughout my uh, teenage years, mostly. Um, and I did spend some time during my med school education in Canada. Um, but overall, I was like born and raised here and plan on staying here. Um, so I'm one of five kids, the middle child, I'm the middle child. Um, and I've had a wonderful childhood, to be honest. My parents worked a lot. They worked really hard um, to give us everything we needed to kind of set ourselves up for, for the future, so to say. And um, somewhere along the way, I think when I was like in my early teenage years, I started to think about what I wanted my life to look like, like long term. And I kind of made this plan in my head. This is what I'm going to do. And this is how it's going to go. And I was very like determined. I was pretty ambitious early on in terms of driven and motivated. And I was very like into learning and exploring and just moving forward. I had a rough time sitting at school. I have to be honest, like I always thought it was a waste of time, uh, not in terms of like what we were learning, but just the aspect of having to sit down for a certain amount of time that was always problematic for me. Um, so I think it was sometimes around when I was 15 that I decided that I'm going to become a doctor, um, and I'm going to study med school. And I started preparing towards the end of high school. I don't know if you know how the school system works in Croatia, but I think it's a little bit different than it is in the States. So here we have high school that is like four years, and then you go straight to, um, the university of your choice. We don't have college and then how things work, I think, in the, in the States. But um, med school is six years total here in Croatia. And um, that's what I did. I got in. It wasn't really easy. I think there were like over a thousand applicants and they were only taking in about 200. Uh, but I studied really hard for like the initial exams and stuff like that. So I got in and I loved it, to be honest. Like it was one of the most incredible experiences of my life. It was a lot of hard work. And, but I developed an even stronger work ethic then and a lot of like self-discipline and just, I think it was an excellent time to explore my own potential and like how far can I really go when it comes to training my brain and when it comes to like absorbing information and knowledge and all of that. So I really loved it. And I had this idea of what my life was gonna look like once I graduate and once I start you know, working and going towards residency and all of that. And I really wanted to see what it was like to, um, to do it outside of Croatia. And we didn't really have these options, like which some other universities have that you can go and do a full year somewhere else. We were pretty like tied up in our own curriculum and our own pace. And we, we have a really good, like the University of Medicine in Zagreb is actually a really, really good one, one of the best ones in Europe. Um, so I had to find my own way and I figured it out. I think I was in, it was in my fifth year that I went to Montreal. Uh, I found this professor who, um, who was Croatian, but he spent the majority of his life working there. And he offered me like an internship um, in their university hospital. And the only issue was that I wasn't, like I didn't know French and it, it's a French speaking region. Um, so it took me about a year to learn French in order to be able to go there uh, because I had to like, 
actually talk to people in the hospitals. One of the disadvantages of our um, education here in Croatia is that it does not offer a lot of practice. It's mostly like cognitive work, mostly just studying and absorbing information and going through exams. We don't work a lot as students. Um, so um, that was a big change for me and just going somewhere where I've never been alone, um, foreign language and language that was like, European French is not the same as Canadian French. I did not know that until I came there. So, um, and once that was over, I came back to Croatia and uh, on my sixth and my final year of med school, I had a baby, my first baby. Um, and I started living with my now husband and I thought it was a good idea to keep going with the exams and to write my thesis and to graduate all in the same year. So I did that, but it was, it caused one of the biggest breakdowns that I've ever had in my life because it was just too much, like the pressure of everything with a newborn baby and just going and doing all the things. So that was kind of my reset period, I think, in life, you know, when you kind of feel like everything's out of control, that was that, was that for me. Um, and I started to slowly recover after a couple of months and uh, we had our wedding then and I started to look for support in different areas because I was a new mom and I was pretty young for my own standards. I was 24 um, and I didn't have any friends or close family members who had babies. Like all of my girlfriends were having the time, the time of their lives. They were, you know, just graduating, traveling, doing all the things. And I was like here with this new baby and with this career that I should be starting. And I had no idea what I was doing. So that was a really really difficult time. And that's how I discovered online support. I was never big into any kind of social media before. Um, I didn't even have Instagram at the time. I think I downloaded the app in 2015 or 2014, something like that. But um, I quickly realized that it's a really good way to learn and to connect with people from all over the world. And um, I started exploring these online forums as well, and I became a part of um, a few American ones where I connected with different moms and I was like learning about how to be, you know, a mom, <laughs> because no one teaches you those things. It's uh, People think it comes like intuitively and a part of it, yes, but there's also this huge learning curve behind it that isn't as simple as people often think it is. Um, so that's kind of how I got into social media. I started connecting with people. I started sharing my own journey through motherhood. And then I started working. And then everything changed because I realized that it wasn't what I was hoping for. Um, I don't know how much you know about this, but um, physicians in Croatia generally are severely underpaid. Um, and they, they typically work a lot. And they are incredible like when it comes to their education and their skill set and their capabilities, they are amazing, but they're severely underpaid and it's it's a broken system. And when I became a part of it, I just felt like this is not what I wanted. <laughs> and I feel like the the calling, like to be a doctor, wasn't as strong in me uh, to make me not um, to make me want to settle for that because I knew like here's the way here's how it goes. You, once you start residency, you don't have a life for five years and you work all the time and you don't make any money or you make very little money. And then once you become like a resident, once you become a specialist, once you start working like on that level, you know, there's always like this limit on your potential. And there's always this, like, this is how much you have to work in order to earn this and that. And I, I wasn't like, I, I felt like I was at this point in my life where I had to sign, like, is this, is this something that I want for myself, like long-term? And it wasn't easy to even go there when it comes to like listening to my own thoughts of maybe choosing something else, because like I've spent all these years educating myself and a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of effort to become this, um, you know, this doctor. And I, but I just wasn't feeling it. Like I hated being away from my babies. That was the most painful part. I was thinking to myself, like, did I really, why, am, you know, why do I have these kids if I can't see them? Like, I don't want that. I would, I, I felt 
I don't even know how to describe that, but it was almost like as this constant feeling of discomfort every single day, just telling me this is not your way. This is not what you want. You should be looking for other things. You should be exploring more. And uh, later on, I realized it was one of my core values, actually. It's freedom. Like it's one of the strongest ones that I have. And I wasn't living in alignment with that. I wasn't free at all. I was very burdened with a lot of things. I had to be in a certain place at a certain time. I had to ask for permission to, you know, have a day off to go on holidays. And I mean, it's not, it's like, it's normal, but for me, it just felt like a violation of myself. I don't know if that makes sense. And it took a while for me to acknowledge that and to actually allow myself to go there with my own thoughts and to not be like, what, what's everyone going to say? Like, how are you going to tell people that you don't want to do this? Like you want, why would anyone want that? Mm -hmm. Especially, you know, my, my family and my friends and everyone. So um, at the time I was also uh, building a community through Instagram, which was like my creative outlet. That was a part of my day besides, you know, being a mom and being a homemaker um, that kind of gave me energy. I felt like it was something that I, it was like this window into what's possible that I wasn't able to see around me. Like I wasn't able to see women living this way anywhere else. I wasn't able to see women, you know, um, doing what they love and making a lot of money and just being free and just, you know, being present for their children and for their families and just being happy in their marriages. And it all felt like it felt unavailable for where I was like at that point in that time in my life in where I was living, like physically. But at the same time, I had this phone, like, and when I would open the app, I would just see it, see the possibilities. Um, so I started exploring and I started dabbing into like being an influencer, but I did, it, it never really resonated with me. I never really enjoyed, I, I felt like that also wasn't freedom for me. If I have to be like constantly in touch with different like brands and different people and just be, you know, um, having to do things the way someone wants me to. I just, I, I just knew that I don't want to do that long-term, which is also one of the reasons why I never monetized my podcast in that way. We never did sponsorships or anything like that. It just wasn't in alignment with, with who I am. Um, and then slowly, um, because I grew that community, I came across like different ways to make money online and um, different ways to like partner with people. And that's kind of how I slowly started my uh, entrepreneurial journey, which was, I think, in 2018, very end of 2017, I think. Um, and in the meantime, I had two babies, two more babies. Um, a lot of different changes. And in, um, I think it was March, 2020, I started my, my podcast, which was um, the reason why was because podcasts were something that um, helped me a lot. I started listening to them probably around the time that I finished I graduated and had my first baby and it was like this amazing way of learning and growing while also not having to sit down and watch a screen which is also one of the reasons why my podcast doesn't have a visual component I love the flexibility and the ability to kind of um, you know walk and listen and do dishes and listen and do like mom things and listen. And it, it has been incredible. And I started thinking to myself, you know, there aren't a lot of people doing this in Croatia. And I feel like a lot of women who are like me could benefit from hearing my story and my personal development journey and just the ways that I've grown as a human. Um, and that's how it all started. And it blew up way out of what I was thinking it could be, honestly. And yeah, it's been, it's been a crazy journey. What, which podcasts were you listening to before you started your own? So they were all like not not local because at the time, like when I when I first uh, explored the podcast app on my iPhone, I think there was only one podcast in Croatian, and it was wow. um, yeah, and it was uh, the um, 
it was led by a couple of guys and it was mostly like they were interviewing entrepreneurs and that wasn't like something I was interested in. So it wasn't, it definitely wasn't something that I could, um, you know, connect to. And I think there was this one small season by one of our, um, uh, one of our well-known, she's actually one of the, um, she's like a business mentor. Um, Thea, her, her name's Thea, maybe you know her. She's also very like active on Instagram and she also has a podcast now and she had a, like a series of episodes back then. And I remember reaching out to her and asking her like all the things about how to start a podcast and, and all of that. But the ones that I was listening to the most were American podcasts and some of them are still like very popular, but they were all like, mostly self-development um, directed. Some of them were run by moms. And I was also very interested in learning from um, female entrepreneurs because that was something that I, like one of the things that I wasn't um, familiar with and that didn't really sound possible <laughs> at the time. Mm -hmm. Well, that's crazy. So you were one of the first people to put up a podcast in Croatian language. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't really know how many of us were there, but um, it's it's also, I don't know if, if there's a platform that shows you like exactly the number of, of, but at the time when I was starting, I believe, and from what I was able to explore, there were only like a handful of podcasts in our own language. I think that the whole scene is just starting to grow, like mm -hmm. barely, we barely scratched the surface, I think. Huh. Well, yeah, I wanted to ask if you knew anything sort of about the scene, but it sounds like it's becoming more popular. Yeah, I think it is, but it's still nowhere near where it could be. Um, I feel like creators are just now starting to see the value of uh, putting out content in, in a form of a podcast. Um, and when you, if you were to compare it to like other parts of the world, it is literally like we are so, uh, <laughs> so far behind because I feel like the culture of listening to people um, is not there yet. Most people are used to like YouTube is something that we became used to over the last decade or so, you know, watching people and watching and maybe learning through that like visual aspect. But when it comes to just listening, I think that's the part that people still struggle with. And oftentimes I get feedback from, you know, women telling me like, I love, I love the idea, but I just can't, it's so weird, you know, to just listen. So I think that we have, you know, plenty of space to grow. And I think for anyone thinking about starting a podcast in Croatian or in any of the surrounding languages, I think now is the time to get in because it's just, it's just getting started the whole market and it's it's just in the beginning stages in my opinion well i saw on a couple different sites and i don't know how accurate you know they can rank that but on one site i saw that you had like the seventh most popular in croatia and then just the other day i looked and i don't know if it was the same site or a different one but it said the number two most popular podcast in croatia i guess in the country i think that wasn't a language thing yeah because there were some american podcasts on there so i think it was in the country of Croatia, you had the second most popular, second most listened to podcast. Yeah, I honestly, I'm not big uh, when it comes to statistics. I don't really, you know, do a lot of research, but I, oh, one of the things that I've learned is that it's not as easy to actually have like a valid, um, how do I say that? I think it's it's not easy to really rank podcasts because there are so many different metrics you could use. And sometimes, you know, when these sites, they will just take this one episode and see like, let's let's check like this week or this day who, who got the most clicks for a certain episode or a download. And then they'll put you up like on the on the on the top and then the next week you're going to be like number seven so it kind of fluctuates but I, but I don't really know like the only um the only recent study so to say that I got was one performed by um by a, by one of one of the like business mentors and her team and they kind of um, they did like a survey um, and they had, I feel like maybe a couple of thousand participants, which also isn't that large of a, you know, 
group of people. And um, there I could see that we were doing really well when it comes to like how many, and, and obviously I have my number of downloads, but I also don't know how relevant that is. I never was really into kind of the numbers. It was more about the message. Mm -hmm. And for you, what's the, like, how do you know that people are getting the message? What is it for you? Like, do you get messages from people saying, you know, thank yeah. you so much? Um, yeah. You know, what, what sort of feedback do you get? And is that what really, you know, makes you feel happy that, you know, I'm actually, I'm doing something with my podcast. I'm reaching people. Yeah, absolutely. It's like, a, the you know, it's been years for me just recording every single week. And it's a real challenge sometimes with four little kids. I mean, I still have a baby like this year. So um, for me, like the driving force has always been the impact. And it, it was never like, I'm going to do this because I want something, you know, for myself. It was more like this creative outlet. As when I was a little girl, I was constantly playing around, like being on a mic and playing, like being on the radio. So this was kind of a full circle moment for me to get into a point in my adult life when I allow myself to just have a mic at home and sit down and share my thoughts and my, you know, my personal growth and all of that. And the, the feedback that I get is mostly just people messaging me or emailing me or leaving comments. And it's been a constant, especially in the past year. And it always blows me away. Like the fact that people are able to listen and implement and change their own lives just like that. It's incredible. Like it's the impact that I feel has been the most, um, the biggest reason why we have the number of downloads that we have and why the, the podcast is as well known as it is. I think it's the impact of my stories and the stories of the people that I interview and just how it moves other people. It activates them. Those who are ready to absorb that kind of content, it's not light or easy. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a specific type of content, but it activates something in people and they start moving and they start making changes. And it's, it's incredible. Hmm. I know another thing that you talk about, and I'm not sure if on the podcast, but I saw on the website um, is minimalism. Yeah. And can you talk a little bit, a bit about how you, you know, how that started and, you know, how you preach about that? Yeah, I wouldn't call myself like the, like a minimalist in terms of, um, you know, how many things I own and stuff like that. But I think it's something that is not often related to family life and motherhood. But I found myself, I think it was like five years ago, in our home feeling so overwhelmed with everything. We had so much stuff, so many toys, so much clothes. So like it was overwhelming. I felt like I could not keep up with my own life and I could not stay on top of things. And it was just too much. And that was kind of a breaking point when I started to implement massive changes into my home, when I, I got rid of like 80% of things, I am not even joking. My husband thought I was crazy. I was on this, uh, on this like decluttering um, spree. It lasted for a week. There were just like dozens of boxes and um, like these big uh, black bags of stuff. I just threw everything away. I donated what I could, but I just, it was like, all of a sudden I could breathe within my own home. And then I realized like my kids actually started playing with the toys that they had left and they couldn't even see them because there were so many. And that's kind of when I started to see how lighter and more beautiful life is when it's simple. And that's when I started to change the way that I was thinking about my home and the way that I was thinking about the things that took up space and time in my home, because let's be real, everything that you have requires your time and time is the most valuable of all of our currencies. And I realized like if I have all these things that I don't know what to do with and I just keep rearranging them and keep, you know, maintaining them, it's just taking up a lot of my time and I don't have as much like I don't have the time to spend like cleaning and decluttering and just um, doing all the things so I started being very intentional when it comes to what I'm bringing into my home we started having these rules for like if a toy comes in a toy goes out if a book comes in a book goes out 
And um, I started sharing about that as well, because I felt that mothers were so overwhelmed because, you know, you're bombarded with all of these things and everyone tells you, you need, need this and you need that and your kid needs all of these toys and then they need all of these you know, things and you need all of that baby gear. And the reality is you don't need anything. Like you get to choose a few intentional items and you get to keep them in your home and you get to enjoy the time that you have to connect with your family. And that's way more important. So that's kind of how it became a part of, of, of who I was. And it wasn't like that before. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I was going to ask if you had any, um, you know, advice for say someone who wants to start getting into minimalism and, but it sounds like you gave a pretty good piece of advice where if something comes in, something else goes out. Is that sort yeah. of your, your rule then? Yeah. And I also think there's a lot of like backend work when it comes to mindset and just letting go of things, because a lot of us were brought up with, you know, this mindset of scarcity and just uh, if you paid for something, it, you know, you, you can't get rid of it. You can't donate it. You know, it's just a lot of people hold on to things because they think, that they're not allowed to let go. Like if I paid for something, if I bought this, how can I let it go? And then I keep piling up, piling up and hoarding. And I think like as a nation, we're pretty much hoarders and we hold, hold on to like a lot of things just because we don't have, we haven't been trained to think abundantly and to think like in a way, you know, why would I keep something if it's not serving me, if it's not bringing me any joy, if it's not helping me live a more fulfilled life. So I think, you know, for me, that was also a big part of just letting go of the things that I spend money on, even though I'm not using them, it's fine. Someone else can use them. It's still a blessing. Mm, yeah. Uh, it sounds like you might get nightmares if you watch. I don't know if you've heard of the show and it's an American show, Hoarders. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I did. I did. Yeah. That's, that's like next level. I haven't seen that in real life yet. Yeah. I haven't seen, I haven't heard about that in Croatia, but yeah, to me, that's just to get to that point. Like, I don't know how that would happen, but yeah, that, that's crazy to me. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, Lucia, do you have any, well, I wanted to ask, first of all, do you have any guests on your podcast? Do you ever bring in a guest um, or do you have any plans for that? Yeah, actually I do. Over the past year, like in 2022, I think I had my record number of interviews. Uh, uh, I bring in people like when I when I choose people for the podcast, I bring in people whose stories I want other people to hear. And I also uh, one of my missions through the podcast is to help uh, entrepreneurs in our region, especially people who do like uh, business in the um, personal development um, industry, so to say, and I bring them on the podcast and they share their stories and they share about their businesses and then people can find them and connect with them. And I have found that the storytelling aspect, like looking from a marketing standpoint is incredibly powerful, just allowing people to hear other people's stories and get to know them better. It creates this connection that does not require, you know, repetitive exposure in terms of they don't have to be following you for months in order to want to work with you. So I interview a lot of like young entrepreneurs, um, a lot of like therapists, coaches, um, a lot of people who sell different kind of programs that are again, something that I would personally invest in. And I, I've, I've just been really uh, focused on normalizing the part of investing in yourself, which I think is still pretty foreign, like a concept that is pretty foreign uh, over here. Like women, they're not really, you know, when you tell them like you should be investing in yourself, like it's okay to pay, you know, for coaching and to pay for therapy. It's like the best thing that you can invest in. You are your own best investment. So that's kind of what we've been working on. I do have interviews pretty much regularly, but um, one of the things that I've noticed is that people prefer um, solo episodes, which is interesting to me. So they really love listening to me speak to myself. Um, so I'm kind of trying to balance that out and just bring in people intentionally, like someone I really, really feel is a, a valuable, um, has something valuable to share. And then I do my solo episodes. And sort of last part to this as we're winding down here, um, what sort of other future plans do you have either for the podcast or for yourself? Do you plan on, you know, maybe doing a couple episodes in English, um, you know, more going international? What's next? 
Yeah, that's an interesting question because um, I had an international platform on Instagram, which was pretty big. I think I had close to like 30K followers there and I used to just speak English. And when I started the podcast, I wanted it to be in Croatia because I feel it felt like that was needed. Like in, in, in English, there were so many podcasts in the same or a similar topic. And I was like, I'm, I want to, I want to stay local there. So I don't really have plans on bringing in people to speak in other languages. Um, I might like, if I, if I found someone who I really wanted people to hear, uh, because they had something nobody else here in our language has, I, I would, but I don't really have that as a plan. So the plan for the podcast is just keep producing, as high quality content as possible to bringing people more value. And I personally plan on um, doing more of um, that work with the people through future programs and stuff that I plan on. I just finished my certification and I'm um, studying to uh, become a therapist as well. So we'll see where things go. But right now I'm pretty, pretty good where I am and just enjoying every step of the way. It's been, it's been a beautiful journey so far. Good. Yeah, that's the most important part. Um, yeah. Well, Lucia, I want to thank you so much for coming on the podcast. You know, where can people find your information? What's your website, your Instagram? Um, so I can send you the links so you can maybe put them in the show notes. But um, yeah, I have a couple of Instagram accounts. I also have a website that I mostly just use for people to listen to, a po to the podcast if they don't have any of the podcast platforms. Um, so yeah, that's mostly where I am. Um, now, Instagram awesome. is probably the best place to find me. Okay. And I'll put, yeah, I'll put everything in the show notes. So everyone listening, you know, can go and, and click on those and find out some more information about you. But Lucia, thank you again for taking the time to do this. And it was a pleasure to have you on the podcast. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Have a good day.